Your weekend was good. We're glad to be back, and we're happy that you are with us. I'm Henrik, and this is Red Ice Radio. The website's redicecreations.com, and redicemembers.com is where you'll find much more of this. Suzanne Posel is an investigative journalist and chief editor of OccupyCorporatism.com, an alternative news website dedicated to exposing the elite and their plans to globalize money, governments, and people. She has expanded out to touch on all aspects of control the ruling elite use to coerce the masses into compliance. And because of this fact, Tusan believes that non-compliance is the answer to combat the new world order. Two main topics for you guys today. A new US house bill that will deepen the mortgage fraud and how it's connected to Agenda 21. And also in the second hour, MIT neuroscientists' quest to implant fake memories. Let's go. Thank you for uh, coming back again, Suzanne. So uh, what have you been up to since we uh, last talked? Uh, keeping busy? Oh, yes. There's a lot. There's always something going on in the news. So I'm busy writing articles. I've been appearing on many radio shows. I have my own radio show that I've been doing on American Freedom Radio um, since la- last time I was on your show. So I'm very, very busy. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you have some good articles out and, and a lot of things going on as usual, of course. And uh, we're going to break some of these down today. Talk about a few of them, a few selected one, if you will, that have been lingering here during the month of July, pretty much. And I think that we should begin with the, uh, the, the bigger one that you... Uh, detail when it comes to new housing bills. Uh, There is a new bill called the Protect America and Taxpayers and Homeowners, basically something that is designed, as usual, in the U.S. here to uh, go in with the the safety explanation. But of course, at the end of the day, uh, we all know who is suffering and and what is going on. But break this down for us, Susanna, when you picked up the story first. Okay, well, here's how it went. And it reminded me of The Creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, the book that G. Edward Griffin wrote when I was researching this article because it's it's very similar. So House Representative uh, Jeb Henserling gets taken onto a ski trip last April with a bunch of technocrats with Visa and uh, MasterCard representatives from Wells Fargo, HSBC, SunTrust, um, J.P. Morgan Chase, and a bunch of others. And they all contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars, which came out to multiple hundreds of millions of dollars to his Jeb Fund, which is the Jobs, Economy, and Budget Fund that he has. So he got paid for his uh, services. And they went on a ski trip and had a great time, just like they did at Jekyll Island when they were deciding the Federal Reserve Act. Yeah. And when he came out of the uh, the ski trip, he had... The uh, what you mentioned, the Protecting American Taxpayers and Homeowners Act, which passed unanimously in the House Financial Services Committee, which he heads. Mr. Henserling heads it. Mm -hmm. So it is now on the House floor for consideration as a bill. And this is absolutely a a very terrifying piece of uh, proposed legislation because with the. The problem with foreclosures, when they set this whole thing up, this goes back to 1995, they set up the MERS system. And the MERS system is the Mortgage Electronic um, Registration System. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is a electronic system. You don't have to have documents anymore. It's all about robo-signing. No human being actually signs these documents. And it gave the banks the ability to... Uh, basically have full control over the financial market, which is why we had a housing bubble to begin with. And a lot of the banks acted as third-party creditors or brokers, which in a lot of states, like in the state of Washington, is illegal. Mm -hmm. And when homeowners started to fight back and take the banks to court to keep their homes, they used 
a lot of their complaints were based on the MERS system because it's illegal. So the banks realized that they had a problem. They had, you know, they had come up with this system to take property away from Americans. It was working except when Americans would go to court. And those Americans that went to court and used MERS as their uh, argument in the, in, the, uh, in the courtroom, they were winning. So hmm. the bankster said, well, we got to fix this because <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> our plan is not working. So they came up with this new scheme. Now, hidden inside... Protecting American Taxpayers and Homeowners Act, which is the acronym PATH. PATH, yep. And in the article, I have the copy of the proposed bill. It has the National Mortgage Data Repository, which is essentially MERS. So it legalizes, and, and on a federal level, the whole construct of MERS. It's now no longer illegal to have... Um, electronic records you the banks don't have to prove that they have documentation that they own the house that they have the right to foreclose on the house mm -hmm. which is what they were coming up in uh, problems in the courtroom they didn't have the documents because this was all electronically based right so if you can't prove that you own the home how can you prove they have the legal right to foreclose it's it's dismissed it's a mistrial you know all these other um Legal ramifications go on and the homeowner walks away with their home. That's not what the banks wanted. So they went and made it legal. So this bill makes it legal. That means that homeowners who are in litigation right now have no legal standing when it comes to the complaint that they filed with the court system. Their, their uh, case would automatically be thrown out hmm. if this came into, if this passed as a law. The other thing that it does is it eliminates future complaints being filed in the court system because, again, they have no legal standing. This takes away Americans' constitutional right to due process. Yeah. And the other thing that it, do, it does, which was the, uh, the, the aspect of this that really terrified me, and when I was speaking to a friend of mine who works in foreclosures, um, she works with attorneys keep, helping people keep their homes, and she works with various organizations to get people the information that they need because it's costly. And if she she's helping right now with an organization that trains people to do all the work themselves and then just hand it off to the to the attorney, and it's cheaper to pay the attorney to go ahead and go into court for and represent you than it is to pay them, you know, six to $10,000 in retainer's fees sure. to do the whole thing. Yeah. She, she and I were talking about this, and our phone kept dropping. Every time I asked her this one question, which was the crux of my argument in this article, because I was wondering whether or not they could go back in time and take the homes from people who had already won their homes and acquire those properties. And every, we tried four times. The phone dropped. The, uh, we couldn't speak to each other. We couldn't hear each other. It was garbled. Um, I basically just gave up after the fourth try and texted her. I wasn't even sure if she would get, get this text message and say, we'll talk about this later. In, uh, I have a legal background. I have a paralegal degree. So my husband and I were sitting talking about this, and um, he was bringing up the construct idea, the philosophy behind double jeopardy. Now, double jeopardy is in criminal law in the United States, but criminal and civil usually have equal um, equal standing between the two. Mm -hmm. If you have, um, if you can be charged by in mur uh, murder in criminal, you can be charged in manslaughter in civil, which is how O.J. Simpson um, he won the murder trial. You know, he was acquitted. Mm -hmm. He didn't win. He was acquitted. But the, the family was able to sue him civilly for wrongful death. I and, see. And they won that. Yeah. So double jeopardy has a similar um, uh, standing in civil, and it's the jeopardy clause. Hmm. Now, the jeopardy clause, it takes an effect unless, and it can be... Um, can be removed and the well let me go back a, a little bit double jeopardy and the jeopardy clause what they do is they protect you from being um, accused of a crime twice or sued civilly for something twice so if you were acquitted of murder you can't then be uh, um, brought criminal charges against you for murder unless certain things happened 
One of the things is in light of new evidence. And that's the layman's term of the, uh, the legal technical term. But the reason why I'm using the layman's term is because if this law, if this proposed bill were to pass into law, this would be in light of new evidence. This would be similar to um, it, with murder. Um, and if you were uh, um, convicted of murder in the 1980s and n with new DNA testing, your, uh, your attorney brought the case again and, and it was proven with DNA testing that you did not commit that murder, then you could be let out of jail, mm -hmm. obviously. Sure. And this is what helps you. And then they can't. And once you're released from jail, they can't go back and and tie you to it. I see. But in in the Jeopardy clause in civil, it would work the opposite for the banks because the homeowners would not be protected under the Jeopardy clause because most of their cases have been dismissed, uh, considered a mistrial because of the problem that the banks had. They can't bring forth evidence, documents, to prove that they owned the home, that they had the right to foreclose because yeah. they were mostly working as third-party creditors or brokers. Yeah. And um, in the states where it's illegal, the, the case gets thrown out. So the homeowner is not protected under the Jeopardy Clause. If this were to pass into law, the banks can then turn around and go back and acquire those properties. Because MERS is legal, and the standing by which they won their case or it was dismissed or whatever, if it were based on the MERS system, well, the MERS system is now legalized. <laughs> and when you look at this in terms of Agenda 21 here in the continental United States, with them wanting to acquire 75 to 85% of the land for non-human use, this makes complete sense to me that they would do this because... Bernanke has been purchasing with QE3 and QE Affinity uh, the mortgage-backed securities from the banks. It's a bank bailout, yes, but it's also a land grab here in the United States. Sure, yeah. So he's acquiring all the land with the mortgage-backed securities. The banks are doing their part to sue and foreclose on these homes. And if this were to pass in the law, they would have free reign to get not only the houses currently in litigation in future um, in the future and no litigation could be brought by the homeowner in the future because they would have no legal standing, no due process. And then they could, like I said, turn around and grab the, the homes that they lost in court and get them back. And then here we go. Hmm. We have no property rights and the implications are staggering. And considering you have 101 million Americans on food stamps right now. Is it that much? Yes. Jeez. Yes. I wrote an article about this. And here's the kicker on that one. The farm bill was just approved and food stamps was not entered into it. They said they'll deal with it later. So right now with 101 million Americans depending on food stamps to pay for food for their families and there's no money right now allocated for that program. So people will either be knocked off the program or they'll have their benefits cut in half. And a lot of families have no way to subsidize that is for some families that is their their food allocation money sure so hmm. you've got a situation here where unemployment is rampant um, people are dependent on the government in various forms of subsidies horrible and now if this passed into law they wouldn't even and it's not just homeowners if you rent a home from someone if you rent an apartment how do you know that the the property is not in foreclosure by the, by the property management company. Mm, yep. And they wouldn't tell you that. And this has to do with businesses. And it has to do basically what I've been told is any, prop any property here in the United States that is not owned by the federal government is and could have been securitized in the whole housing bubble and the whole debacle that caused the crash in 2008. So potentially the technocrats are going after every piece of property that is not owned by the federal government. And since they control the federal government, that would be every piece of property in the United States. So the bigger picture here, though, it's interesting you tie that back to Agenda 21. And I mean, what I've seen so far is that what they do with the houses that they foreclose on is that they turn around on it and, and you know, try to sell it to someone else, basically. But in the long run, do you think that what would happen is that these properties would not be developed anymore? More the house would be knocked down and that would be it and there would just be an empty lot there, if you know what I mean? A lot of the properties here in the United States are not being um, resold. There are problems in um, suburban areas 
where rats are infesting the homes that are not, um, there's nobody in them, the, the homes that were foreclosed on, and neighbors next door are having problems hmm. with rat infestations. The, the houses are deteriorating. They're sitting there. Nothing's happening to them. Hmm. And it's because they don't care. You know, a lot of people, when I speak to people who are going through the foreclosure process, um, maybe to have them on my show or if I'm working on an article, uh, they all have the same question. Well, they just want my house because they want to resell it. Not a lot of people who are dealing with foreclosures understand Agenda 21. That's right. Yep. And when you look at that map that was created in the 1970s by that professor, you see that there's so much land how would they acquire that land? And to, in, in my opinion, based on what in my research and my articles, I, I see that they're doing it in this backdoor way that, that is not apparent to anyone paying attention. That's right. Really, you really have to sit down. You have to look at Bernanke. Bernanke makes these statements like he came out a couple of weeks ago and said that um, mortgages were a thorn in, and I'm paraphrasing, mortgages were a thorn in the side of this whole entire economic problem and banks had to tighten up their lending practices. Well, we've seen evidence of that. People who ha- want to get a, um, a loan for 100000 100, or under are having a really hard time getting that loan. Yeah. And then if you want to get a loan over 100000 you have to jump through even more hoops than you already had. You basically have to give away, you know, maybe your firstborn son. And I'm being, <laughs> you know, extreme, but, but they are just, they are not wanting to, to lend out any money because um, they've already got these other dealings with the, with the mortgages. They don't want to have any more problems. They're trying to acquire as much property as, pop, as possible, as quickly as possible, so that they can just go in there, take it, and get out, and nobody realizes what's going on. And by the time people do, it's too late. So this is really at the end of the road here. So, well, what we can see so far with Agenda 21, it's not it's not really about the money now anymore. This is about the resources. This is about the actual, you know, the realty, the 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 land. Because, I mean, let's face it, they print the money and they have as much money as they could spend in a million lifetimes. A lot of these people are in charge of this and behind this. So I don't think it's that much. It's, I mean, of course, greed is a modality for for some of these people to enable what they've done, but it's not the the end all. There's so much more here. There is. In November of last year, the Bank for International Settlements had a meeting with all the central bank, the heads of the central banks all across the globe, and they decided that they were going to, uh, they well, they told all the central banks that they had to liquidate all of their assets by 2019. Then earlier this year, Bernanke came out and said that the banks had to get rid of all of their capital. And Mm. I said, oh, here we go. He's implementing the Basel III Accord. I said, okay, here we go. So they have, you're exactly right. Yes, they're greedy. And yes, they want money. And and they enjoy the, the things that come with the money and the power and the stature. However, the point of this scheme is to acquire land. The more land that they acquire the less they have to worry about the fact that they are not working on a um, a fiat system that is based on anything like uh, gold or silver or any precious metals. It's based on credit and, and credit from one guy to another. So in the federal, um, in the central banking system, they're stealing from Paul to pay Peter all the time. Yeah. Now the, the BRICS nations are backing all of their fiat in precious metals and they're still trading their fiat, but the fiat is worth whatever precious metal stores they have in each respective country. That's very different from the, the central bankers. So the central bankers are going after physical land. The, the countries that they control, they're coming after the physical land so that they, they have actual, uh, their, their fiat is now worth something that they can, they can tangibly say, I own Germany. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. And yeah. here's, here's how much it's worth. Look at all this German land I have. You mentioned Basel III, the the third installment of the Basel Accord, um, and this was actually developed then in response to basically the financial crisis and everything else. What, what more do you know about that and how that's been implemented so far and what that means? Well, they put out a report in 2012 saying, and this was really, I mean, it's not funny, but it is kind of funny. 
they said, oh, the central banks have been trying really hard to prop up the system, but the, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. the global <laughs> markets are just so, so messed up and the central banks just can't keep it up. They're like Atlas. They're shrugging and they're under the weight of this whole thing that they created. They did this. Don't complain about something that you did, but yeah, yeah. They, they did that. And so this is where all of this is coming from. They want liquidation of assets. They want hard assets for the banks. They don't want to lend out money. They they want to keep everything in. They want to acquire as much land as possible here in the United States. They're doing it through the mortgage-backed securities. Over in other countries, they're doing it through economic terrorism. And uh, it, It's the same thing. It's just in different flavors. You know, here in the United States, respectively, one out of three homeowners, it could be a registered gun owner, is statistically speaking. So you don't want to just come in and say, this is mine and I'm going to take it. Yeah, but it doesn't work that way. If this, yeah, no, no. If someone has a gun, you don't do that. <laughs> but <laughs> in in if this uh, path were to pass into law, effectively, I'll give you an example. I could walk up to you and say, that's my car. And you would say, no, it's not. It's mine. I bought it from the dealership. No, it's my car. And I'm going to sue you and you're going to have to pay me for the for the car. The payment's to me, not the, not the dealership. Yeah. I could take you to court and win and then you could pay me. You would have to pay me. And I would never have to prove that that was my car. <laughs> wow. You can't own property, man. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's back to that point again. You know, kind of, this is the, um, I think that the small amount of freedom that was uh, both given and partially taken, if you will, by the United States is, was something that might have been beneficial for them for a while to, to build up another empire, just like, you know, the, the you know, Great Britain before that, etc., but now at this point, what we're witnessing, I think, is just the taking back of all that. Basically, it was like, all right, you've had enough, you know, come back to the table as the rest of us here. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I'm seeing happen to the to America right now. Well, yeah, if, I was just watching um, the light bulb conspiracy last night and it remind and this conversation a great reminds one. me of that. I love that. <laughs> it's um, planned obsolescence. I've, yes. I've been mentioning this now a couple of times in the last few shows. But yeah, tell us about it. I, you know, I've watched it several times and it just, and and it's shocking to me how it it reminds me of what we're talking about now because they, they had a culture, a needs culture. They turned it into a desire culture with Edward Bernays in the early twenties. And then they had a problem. They had too much production and not enough consumers. And instead of mandating by law with the light bulb that, um, uh, I'm sorry, with planned obsolescence becoming federal law, they did it the other way. They used social engineering to create a culture where they where people would say before the the item um, had its shelf life, before it got to its death date, people would be giving it away, donating it to uh, charities or or um, goodwill or or um, secondhand stores or antique stores. And, and continuously purchasing new items because it was cool, because every three months you need that new pair of jeans, because you're leasing your car and you don't really want your car anymore. It's been two years. You need a new car. That's right. Because they've got that new iPhone out and it's, who cares if you've only had your phone for three months? The new one's out. Yeah. You'll get it. Yeah. It's a lease culture. You know, it's like, you can, and again, you don't actually own anything. You're just partially renting it and then they progressively are updating it for you. That's what you're talking about here. Yes, exactly. We're paying rental fees. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Yeah. And but we think that we own these things. We think that the property taxes, which are actually rental fees, because if you think about it, if I want to build a well on my property and I have to go ask the city for permission, I don't own my property. That's that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm paying rental fees. And I wonder also how how much I mean, there's been disputes about this. It's kind of funny. Some people build their house on on um, you know, tall poles basically to get it off the ground. Um, and, and I wonder how, how deep down as well, because that's another thing, right? When they do fracking and stuff like that, even that they do it underneath your property, a certain, you know, length or whatever. I don't know if this is in the contract when you buy the property or whatnot, but that's also kind of, uh, there's been a number of disputes on, on those levels, you know, above and underground. Well, it's funny that you bring that up because one of the companies that made their, themselves known at this ski trip was Coke Industries. And Coke Industries is heavily invested in petrol and fracking. And there are a lot of citizens and towns and class action lawsuits against all of the poisoning that is happening to the to the people, the residents, because of the fracking that's going on. This would this has far reaching implications, this PATH Act beyond uh, mortgages. 
since Koch brothers was there, essentially you would not have legal standing to sue if you were being poisoned or if you could light your tap water because of all the methane because of the fracking. Um, if you, you know, a lot of, a lot of children and elderly people are dying faster because of the poisoning that's happening. Um, you would have no legal standing to sue. Visa and MasterCard were there. If you had charged off um, a debt, they could come back and sue you for that debt. And now you would owe, you'd be in litigation at a time when you're broke and you have no job and you just lost your home. And now they're coming back after you for, for debt that you charged off maybe last year or, or maybe like 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, if we, for a moment, go back to planned obsolescence again. The, it's also this idea that nothing is built to last and work and operate. It's all about the high of the new, pretty much. And this is, of course, uh, consumer culture. This is what it's been turned into. And then yet at the same time, on the polar opposite to this, you have Agenda 21 and all these environmental propagandists who are actually not not, not at all about the environment, uh, but but they speak nothing about these kinds of things. You know, usually, in a way, this, I, I don't hear this level of critique on it that, all right, why don't we, you know, try to try to build things as good as we can uh, build a product that actually lasts, uh, you know, it was like if you go back to the 40s and, and 50s, some of the TV sets that were like, they were lasting for 20, 30 years, even more in some cases. Um, today, what what's the lifetime? Three, four years, five maybe, you know? The, that is the brilliance of social engineering and propaganda. And a lot of people, uh, uh, especially the audience, they hear terms all the time in talk radio or in articles or... Um, or alternative television that you're being propagandized to or, or uh, Edward Bernays. But we, we don't explain to the audience enough, in my opinion, what that actually means, how you can see it in real time. And that is a perfect example that, no, we can't. We cannot build anything that lasts because it has to do with production and consumerism. And since we were turned into a desire culture – going all the way back to 1928 with Edward Bernays using psychology based on Freud, we absolutely don't have the mental capacity to think any other way. It's generational. It's been going on for 80 years and they have gotten us to the point where we don't even, we completely accept, you know, it was funny was before the, uh, the light bulb was put into plans of obsolescence. It had a shelf life or, or an active life of, um, 2,500 hours. And then after they implemented planned obsolescence, they put out advertisements saying guaranteed 100, uh, 1,000 hours, guaranteed. Anybody who would remember the light bulb before then would say 1,000 hours, so it's what? Nothing, I used yeah. to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But after generations, people start to say, wow, 1,000 hours is a lot. You yeah. know, pe- and from now when get my him, mother grew and up. And now get them with, your, with the mercury in it. <laughs> yeah, don't drop it. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing was we have because of this culture, you know, people like in in Uganda, that's just basically a dump where we just throw all of our stuff that is still useful, but because it's not new and it's not um it's been 3 months since you had it, uh we just dump it onto other countries and we create uh, huge landfills. And so they complain all the time that we have to recycle, we have to recycle, but it's mandated that we throw this stuff away. And then it gets dumped into these third world countries and poisons their water and, and pollutes the area and nobody cares. Yeah. And by the way, these new green you know, light bulbs beyond the mercury, they actually hold, they have many more components in them. They even have a small uh, uh, circuit board basically inside of the light bulb, but there's much more... Uh, junk in those than it actually was in the in the old in, incandescent light bulb. And by the way, I just want to mention this as well that f- for people who think that this is all, you know, uh, capitalists' fault or or whatever. I mean, this was a of course a uh, a cartel that was formed when it comes to the light bulb conspiracy. But you do have a socialist conglomerate coming in and participating in the development of this type of culture as well with the reasoning, at least. And this was the case with it when it came to the light bulb that there was a reasoning that you know they were worried about the jobs as well the protection of okay wait a minute we can't have we can't produce this product 
to last so long because eventually, you know, our factory will have will close down pretty much. I mean, there will still be need for it, of course, but there will be less uh, production of it because it will last longer. So the ones we make now are not going to be sold until, you know, X amounts of years later. But I think they managed to play the unions and everything well as a part of this as well to say that, okay, we need to protect our jobs. And so instead of focusing on, you know, as I said before, build something that lasts, make it well, and then we as mankind can move on and say, all right, let's tackle the next problem. What can we, what can we build now? There will, be, there will be new jobs. There will be new industries. There will be new problems for us to solve and, 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 and you know, jobs for everyone to do. But instead, we've, we went kind of, I guess, the coward's route. That's how I see it. So, so the industrial capitalists at the top benefited on it for the sake of this being a cartel. And then you have the rest of the people kind of just go, going along with this because it's, it, it, it meant security, protection, and jobs. But at the end of the road, look at it now, what has happened? Now we don't even, you know, we have, we have neither right now. Right, because we, we became a capitalist society. And I'm not saying that I'm not for, you know, owning a business and, and selling a product and, and making money and, and feeding your family. Sure. But before that, we had a, a needs culture where people bartered and traded. And what if you had tomatoes and I had eggs and you wanted to have eggs for breakfast and I wanted to have some uh, spaghetti sauce, we traded or we traded labor. Um, yeah. I, I went and worked your field for a meal at the end of the night. And everything was taken care of and everybody took care of each other. That's part of the reason why people um, didn't starve to death as much as they would have or they would today because back then every, the farmers were still there and people could still go to the farms and get a box of food. Nowadays, you can't do that. And if we had a situation like 1929 today, it would be catastrophic. Yeah. But as far yeah. as um, the, the, you, the socialism involved in the capitalism, once they turned us into a capitalist society, which is another form of control for the banksters because it follows in with consumerism. People who are capitalists are also consumers and they go hand in hand. And so you can't have one without the other. The thought that we would have items that we could build that would be long lasting or forever lasting is a is a concept that threatens um, the consumerist society and the capitalist society that uh, facilitate the the control of the higher ups, the the um, the shareholders and the investors, which end up being the banks. So we can't have that. Absolutely. You'll you will almost unless we bring this down, you would almost never see um, a, a free trade or, or bartering system where people would not have to go without. But then, you know, as I'm saying this, I'm starting to think, well, what about communitarianism? And I sound like a communitarianist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I even though I I I take it for for the listeners that that hear this um I take this with uh, a grain of salt. I have a friend who lives in a town that was just trans uh turned into a transition town. And everyone in in, in the town was really upset that Agenda 21 had taken over their town and now they had new laws and new ordinances that were based on UN uh, proposals for um, um, CO2 emissions. So they couldn't have electricity. They had to, some businesses went out of business. The residents of that town decided to take the communitarianism that was forced on them and turn it into something that would work for them. And so Ickley got really upset Mm -hmm. because their transition town, they took over their transition town. They took it back from them. And I think that when, when it comes to these, um, these systems, when they come in and they take us over, we can take it back. You know, I care about my environment. I recycle and, and um, I buy used goods before I buy new goods because they're still good. But I don't appreciate... Um, being taxed because I'm breathing and I don't believe that well, yeah. the earth is changing uh, temperatures because of my breathing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, bottom line is that what you're talking about here is that the, the, the time, you know, previous to all this in, immense social engineering that's been ongoing. Uh, and, and we have layers of this, of course, we go back in history, we have feudalism, et cetera. But, but the idea there is that if people were free to do as they wanted to do and no third party were in there taxing you or telling what goods you you know should sell or buy or how you should produce it or wh who you can't sell to, whatever, 
I mean, the, the bottom line is you shouldn't be forced into any of these systems. And I think a, a time, uh, you know, previous to this was better because people were not as dependent on, on these, on the third party, if you will, government or other institutions. Some people could manage also for themselves and do stuff. They knew how to do stuff. Today, it's like we're, we, we lack, you know, m- the majority of people lack the capability of taking care of themselves because they've never been in that situation. So if the system falls, if the system breaks down, so will the people living in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and going back to property, um, I had written an article about a, a woman named Kate uh, Barnett in Ohio because she came home from work one day. She said there was a padlock on her door and all of her belongings were taken out of the house except for a few chairs. And the bank, the, the first national bank in town had foreclosed on her home and they were supposed to foreclose on the guys across the street. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and when she gave them an um an itemized uh list of everything and and what it was worth, they told her that they're not going to pay her back. She asked for uh, essentially $18,000. Considering um a hardworking mother who's a nurse and has a, a small family of her own and a single mother, $18,000 is not a lot. They wanted receipts. Some of the stuff she'd purchased it at uh, garage sales some of the stuff had been purchased many decades ago right they said that she since she couldn't prove a based on their standards how what was in the house and how much it's worth and they're not going to pay retail for it they're not going to uh, compensate her for it and they 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 have no responsibility for what they just cost wow yes what what happened and, with that case is that resolved in any way no, she's now going to have to uh, take them to court. So now this working single mother of, uh, I think she's got two or three children, she's going to have to get a, an attorney and sue them. And she's not uh, the first one. I, I went and looked at how many people have, have had this happen. And this was, um, uh, there was another case in, with Bank of America. A gentleman in Florida got so angry when Bank of America wrongfully uh, foreclosed on his home that he sued them. And he won. And so in the judgment, they refused to make payments. He went and uh, went back to court and got a lien on the branch property. So he foreclosed on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Which yeah. is exactly what we should be doing. And they, wow, and, just go, and going to the court, you know, with all the costs, of course, that that involves. And at the end of the day, the all the people there will get paid, of course, but but go, just this idea of going to the system that created the problem to to solve it, what a oh, what a nightmare, you know? Absolutely, most of these people are not they, they don't they're not made of money, and with the, the with the destruction of the middle class, even though they were making six figures, it's the money isn't worth what it used to be, and most of them have lost their jobs, so they're living off the savings if they had any savings, because most people are trained to live on credit. Over over generations, we've been trained since the 1950s. Go ahead and buy it on credit. Don't worry about it. And then when this crash happens, nobody has any money in savings, and you, your credit cards get maxed out really, really quickly. Yeah. So these people, that's why they end up on the subsidies like we were talking about before. So they don't have the money to go and fight the banks, and the banks know this. And yeah. this is what they want. This is, this is how I say that they wanted to reform the economic system by completely crashing it, making, you know— basically reaching the bottom end of this thing. Well, it's not there yet, though. It could be, get even worse, of course, as we as we know and, and as we've been talking about here. But the bottom line is that if people are not capable enough, again, to to, to go out of the situation and, and begin to become independent and men for themselves, they are going to be in a, in a even worsened position of dependency upon these systems and whatever they offer as the fix, people will have to take. And that's that's what's dangerous about this. Well, absolutely. We, you mentioned fracking earlier and we were talking a little bit about it. Um, I just watched Gasland 2 a couple of weeks ago. And what shocked me the most about that film, and I recommend everyone listening, please go watch this film. The, the most shocking part will be halfway through the film when they start to mention how the fracking companies began employing PSYOP. They, they had seminars to train the people who worked for the, for the fracking companies and the um, legislators and local um, municipalities to use psychological operations to convince the public that what was happening to them was not happening and that it was a good thing. 
and using all of this propaganda, pro-propaganda for how wonderful it is to, to use the fracking uh, system, which w- originated in the UN, by the way. Mm-hmm. It, it's a scheme that started with their documents several decades ago, hmm. um, along with ocean fertilization. And um, since then, they've rescinded, but originally it was cool to go ahead and geoengineer the planet as much as you want well this this is to drive people off the land again there's i don't know if you saw this movie and uh you know you pick up where i'll where I interject here but it's called promise promise land it's with matt damon and another guy from the office it was actually pretty interesting it showed some uh maneuvers basically like you're talking about psyops basically where one guy comes comes into the town and basically convinces everyone that this is a bad idea only to basically you know, turn it all around, you know, towards towards the end. I won't give it all away. I recommend to watch it called Promised Land, but it shows some of this. And ultimately what the conclusion here, and this is allegedly, you know, it's an anti-fracking film and all that. Uh, and there's always question marks surrounding, you know, the motive and everything else. But basically it shows this clever strategy that they have to, this is about driving people off the rural land into cities. There can't be any more Agenda 21 than that. Absolutely. and And fracking is about that. What they what they're doing in the Gulf is about that forty billion dollars with the Army Corps of Engineers with a depopulation agenda. Um, I just recently wrote an article about um, about Halliburton. Halliburton is cooperating with the Department of Justice, so they gave sixty five million dollars to the uh, Federal Wildlife and and Fishing um, Agency, which is. Some of the agents work for a presidential task force that is working on the uh, mandated by executive order clean up the federal um, uh, oversight of the cleanup of the BP oil spill. Mm -hmm. So basically what Halliburton did is they admitted that they destroyed evidence concerning the BP oil spill. But because there are in um, working with the DOJ on an investigation, they're not going to be charged with any other criminal activity. They handed off $65 million to bribe the Obama administration to keep them from having any more charges brought against them. And they get to walk away scot-free. Meanwhile, people are dying. The Corexit that was used to clean it up, it's now gotten into the atmosphere, raining down from the sky and getting all over everything. People are eating it, whether you're eating the seafood or not. The seafood is being shipped to other parts of the country where people are not privy to the um, what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So they're eating Corexit laced food that is coming out of Louisiana, Alabama and Florida and all that area. Mm. Yeah. And these corporations get to do whatever they want. Sure. $65 million. I Here, let me write a check. Who do I make it out to? You know? Yeah. It, it's, um, it, it's almost like it's a, uh, it's a plan to let Everyone run amok as much as they can. Just let 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 all the vile bastards into the system and let them just completely just do whatever they want. So that at the end of the day, people who are witnessing this and will wake up to this will demand a a solution and a fix to this. And what I see coming down the road is an even more staunchly regulated system. And I think many people in the, at the beginning of that then will they will take that. They will swallow that. They'll think. Finally, now we put a stop to all this greed and all these, you know, complete psychopathic maniacs at the top, um, <laughs> only just to be had, only just to realize later on down the road that, wait a minute, now we've moved into an even worse system of control and regulation that is basically going to turn this into a, a prison planet. I see, what I'm getting at here is that the, I see that the the rampant corruption that's happening, the the financial scandals and everything else is is sanctioned, as I mentioned many times before in the program. It's it's kind of it's allowed to happen so that the you know the, this is the problem, and so that the solution will be be offered, so that we will just walk straight into this trap. What do you see here, Susan? I absolutely agree with you because that is how it's been. It's it's worked so well for them for eighty years. You know, with Edward Bernays, it's worked so well convincing people when 9-11 happened, we all bought those little flags and put them on our lapel and looked over at George Bush Jr. like he was a fearless leader and said, what are you going to do about this? Yeah. When somebody should have tried trying to figure out how that was possible, independent um, independent uh, people should have gotten together to do investigations. Yeah. Regardless yeah. of what the regardless of what your government says. Exactly. 
do we have the right to, to say anything or do anything? Or do we have to wait for the government to do it? And, and apparently we have to wait for the government to do it. It's about responsibility, doing the research on who we're supporting and what we're supporting to be able to pull out of those people that we do not agree with or, or, or on that level where they basically are in the process right now of wrecking the system for, for what it is, you know? Um, so ultimately, although that there's a lot of shitheads in the world, I always go back to personal responsibility. Do you? I absolutely do. I've been, I have uh, fully embraced the concept that has been, uh, David Icke talks about this. My friend Karen Quintosado talks about this. Non-compliance. Seriously. Stop complying with the system. Yeah. I, I, I tell my listeners, make a list tonight of all the ways that you comply with the system. Do you go to Starbucks to get your coffee in the morning? Do you go to BP to gas up your car? I mean, what do you do in the throughout the day that that you comply and help this machine keep going and try at least one take one off the list every week or once a month and do this habitually so that you train you retrain your brain out of the propaganda out of the idea that you have to comply with the system the idea that oh if i don't vote then the other guy will win no cuz your vote never counted to begin with so it doesn't matter it's ceremony it's just to make you think that it counts so you know what stop complying you know so we need to get rid of the stockholm syndrome that we all have the blanket that we've that we've all been under and just say you know what i don't like the ethics of walmart i'm not going to shop there anymore i don't like the ethics um, I know one gentleman who stopped driving completely because he didn't want to give any money to the oil companies anymore. Well, but Walmart is cheap, right? It is cheap, and I understand <laughs> that I, I do. And, 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 and I've gone back and forth with people because now we're in a situation where we can't afford the luxury of saying, I don't want to support this because at the end of the day, your kids want food. And are you going to – a lot of people have come to me and said, honestly – if it's a choice, I don't have the money. If it's a choice between not feeding my kids and giving them GMO food, I'm going to give them GMO food because I'm not going to let them go to bed hungry. Well, and I understand yeah. that. Yeah. But we need to, there are other ways to extract the money that we're wasting in other places so that we can afford to buy the good food. There's, there are other things that we can do. The, the fact of the matter is most of us have been so trained in this convenience culture that we don't want to do it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And we don't know how to, because I mean, let's face it, what, what are the options for people when it comes to setting up to alternatives to some of the things that we use on a, on a daily basis in our lives? I mean, what's yeah. needed is good, talented people who, who have the ability to set it up. But let's face it, busting into the, let's say, the petrol industry at this stage is not the easiest. But there are, you know, a few um, independent stations out there. I, I mean, whatever can be done needs to be done. But there is a certain uh, certain stretch as well where you, where you basically you are limited to the options that are available for you. And until something becomes available, you will have to do what you can. And, and at, at that stage, you do the least amount of, you know, what is going to impact you the least, I guess. But, uh, you know, because it's not, it's not about just giving up either. I, I see. I, it's, there's, there needs to be, of course, a, uh, we need to perpetuate and, and, and try to work things out and offer an alternative down the road and, and to make it work and to make it, uh, you know, function as it is. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's not easy. It's not easy to, to, to set up and, and even look and find alternatives in some cases, you know? Sure. Yeah. My mother used to make all of my clothes. She had a sewing machine. She would go and get a pattern. She would get some fabric and she would make them. Why not go back? You know, the idea of going backwards a little bit is like you were mentioning before. Most people don't know how to sew anymore. They just go and buy a new shirt when the button comes off. They because they've been trained to do so. Their their mother or father, even going back, you know, just one generation. My mother didn't teach me how to sew. What my mother taught me was all of the uh, feminist ideal ideology, because she grew up in the '60s and was burning her bras, and she didn't want me to be a housewife and a mother. Which, ironically, I'm a housewife and a mother because I see the value in raising my children and not letting some other person or some uh, government or state funded entity yeah. telling my children what's right and wrong well, and giving them their value system. Well, exactly. Well, the feminist movement was completely uh, funded by the same powers that were behind, you know, the psychology of Bernays and all those people. So there you go. You know, it was about Absolutely. taking taking women out of the house and putting them into the, you know, creating another consumer basically and getting more, uh, you know, more market value for all the humans that are available on the planet, you know? 
Yeah, and there's another person that they can tax. Now we've got yeah. two people in the house that we can tax. That's, That's right. wonderful. Yeah, and, and previously we had one salary taking care of the whole household. Now, you know, two can can out, hardly even make up, you know. It doesn't oh. Yeah, it's, I know. it's it's very it's very sad, but I was also want to mention this as well that there are there are new people out there who are who are good and setting up um, I don't know if you call it a new industry, but with the web and all the web shops and everything that's available, there's a lot of freaking cool stuff out there right now. People who are setting up new things and doing things with with this kind of conscious awareness, if you will, of the poisons that have been poured into you know everything that, that we that we buy uh, from from GMOs to just creating instead natural products that are uh, you know functioning and, and healthy and everything else. And and those are the people that we need to support. I don't see us going out of the, you know, financial uh, game, if you will, altogether is going to to solve it. I think that that's been another level of propaganda that they want to put on people. They they for ex- for example they they demonize money in a way so that people will stay away from it instead of becoming successful and creating something that they can do, and then instead having people support them and those people support other people who are good, so that you instead isolate, if you will, uh, a, a portion of the financial uh, you know, sector, if you will, that's out there and keeping that money in, in a good sphere. Do you see what I'm getting at, Suzanne? But instead they've told people, no, just, you know, stay away from it altogether or it's evil or it's wicked or if you try to do something, you're just part of the system, blah, 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 you know. B- but meanwhile, there all g- are good people out there that should be supported for what they're doing. Well, yes, the, the audience in alternative media has pr- been programmed as well. They've been programmed to look for certain things that may or may not be the way that they appear, and yet that is COINTELPRO. Th- these psych, you know, um, psychological operations, um, uh, government agents and plants, that stuff does happen. But I, it's not as rampant as people would think, and it's been used mostly to to discredit people who are actually trying to do something good in this movement as opposed to the people who really do. Uh, have been put in this movement to sway the audience in a certain way as the t- as the flow th- of the trend and the temperament of the audience is becomes available for manipulation to go ahead and push them along that way because there have been rock stars have been created there are useful idiots in this in this industry as well and it is an industry and it goes back to uh, right wing extremism that was written in two thousand and nine where they stated that they wanted to infiltrate what was becoming the alternative media that we know today and people have been in the in the movement for a very long time uh one of them being the the owner of american freedom radio he and i've discussed this at length and he remembers 20 years ago the what we call the alternative media today is very different than what it was back then it's very controlled it mirrors the uh the mainstream media and the idea and the argument behind that is, well, people who are asleep will feel comfortable looking at something that looks like mainstream but isn't mainstream. But what it also does is it allows the differential between the information that's being disseminated to uh, basically become in- inconsequential or non-existent. And so the, the information is not being disseminated. Change is not being facilitated. Fear is what's being sold. And so people buy products out of fear and people do things out of fear. And when people do things out of fear, bad things happen and change happens, but it comes from the opposite side. And it basically becomes orders that are disseminated down that we now have to follow because we're too stupid to deal with our own lives. We're too afraid. We're like deer in the headlights. We look to leaders wherever we find them to do what we should be doing, which is each in our individual life, say to ourselves, look ourselves in the mirror honestly and say, how am I participating in this? And where do I want to stop? And do I care more about my, my family or even myself? Just, just as a self-preservation um, mechanism, do I care enough about myself not to participate in the system? Yeah. I'm not surprised by this either, though. If you watch something like uh, The Merchants of Cool, um, it was a, a PBS actually by Douglas Rushkoff, and he shows how many of these marketing creeps have been, you know, involved in focus groups that are all about trying to tap into the undercurrent or the countercurrent or going to, you know, the counterculture or the teenagers to try to kind of tap into, you know, w- w- what's what's in pretty much, what's cool, what's new, what do we need to uh, sell, you know, or how do we need to 
transform something in order to sell it. And and I think that this happens in all the industries pretty much. And, and, and therefore, I think we've been able to see that the media has reacted in a similar way, although maybe fairly slow, actually, comparatively. Uh, but I think that they're slowly now catching on as well. And, and as the alternative becomes a new mainstream, if you will, uh, th- then this is bound to happen. This is this is a process, I think, that happens in all fields constantly. When something new and popular happens or arises, then all everyone jumps on that immediately to try to you know get in on the game pretty much. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, Suzanne. It reminds me of a statistic, sometimes uh, just for fun, because I, what I do becomes very overwhelming looking at all of this corruption day in and day out. Yeah. I was watching an episode of um, the Colbert Report, and he was outing, uh, they, were, they were talking about Trayvon Martin and, and George Zimmerman, and he was uh, showing clips from mainstream, and uh, they, they brought up a statistic. 42% of African-American males have been involved in a violent act or will be involved in a violent act, uh, including um, using a gun or some sort of weapon in order to kill someone. Well, when you look at that statistic, it's it's really scary, 42%. Oh, my gosh. And then they were using that as a way to, to, to start telling their audience that we should be afraid of young black um, uh, American, African-American males. But... When you look at the bigger picture, as far as the population of young black males in in America, that 42 percent then gets dropped down to point zero zero one three five nine. And there's a bunch of other numbers behind it. It's inconsequential. It's not even worth mentioning. The only reason why they mentioned it was because it facilitates the idea that we need to have a race war. We need to have division between each other. We need to be scared simply because of the color of someone's skin, and we need to tr- we need to judge people based on how they look and not their actions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all these groups they use uh, also they use superficial identification to kind of you know uh, you know that that those superficial modalities is what's going to tell them who they are or whatever instead of going inward, if you will. Those are used to create just as you say conflict on the streets and turning uh, basically. I think all over the globe right now, but particularly in in Europe and in in America as well, to turn it into kind of a, a a cold civil war, if you will. That's that's what I'm seeing, and and taking the fight on the on the smallest levels possible to prevent people from basically uh, getting to a point where they can actually feel some kind of rest and peace and start looking upward the the pyramid and and see who's at the top of that. It's a very clever, uh, it's a clever you know tactics, and and unfortunately people have. Uh, uh, a lot of people have fallen for that, you know? Yeah. It, it, with them, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They've been using the same tactics over and over and over again. And while we're doing this and arguing about this and trying to figure this out, they are stealing our land. St- our rights don't exist. I mean, going back to that uh, that PATH uh, proposal in, in the House, basically your constitutional right to due process is now gone how can they do that because you're not paying attention because you're worried about Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman because you're worried about um, everything else that's going on and all the other things that you hear about and and this bill has gotten very little coverage except in the foreclosures circles but in the um, the alternative media very few people have picked this up and, and talked about this and if that went into if that went into law, that would that would hurt everyone. I don't care if you own your home or not. I don't care if you're renting or not. If you got a piece of property through inheritance, yeah, you know, yeah. All right. Well, Susan, we, let's wrap up in a little bit here. I want to talk a little bit more about your website, of course. Give that out for people who want to follow you more on a regular basis and check out your articles and all, and all that. But just before we do that. What what do you see, you know, uh, projected forward here then if and when uh, PATH, if you will, Protecting American Taxpayers and Homers Act, a, a nice title, of course, for it. But if that goes into effect, what uh, what will be the end result of that and how quick could things, uh, you know, kind of escalate or, or just unfold here from this point? Uh, if it were to pass into law, it would effectively take away all legal standing of anyone who is in Uh, litigation currently or would be in litigation or was in litigation. Your home is not safe even if you want it in a court of law. And and no property is safe. 
And like we were talking, the Visa and MasterCard was involved. Major retailers were involved. Uh, Coke Industries were involved. Was so Go- this is was not Google just... involved as well, by the way. No, no, no it not was in this basically. One. It was basically the the heads of people who control our financial market and in consumer markets as well. Yeah. So wherever you spend your money, you are then um, possibly liable to f- uh, litigation coming at you if you had a dispute over um, purchases. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about something else there, but uh, yeah. Well, let's let's pick this up and many other stories as well. I want to get into this uh, how MIT neuroscientists actually can implant fake memories into the brains of rats right now. And of course, they're looking at the, implementing this on human beings as well for, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote, curing post-traumatic, you know, stress syndrome and all that. But we're going to get into that in the, in the second here. Uh, give us the details, Susanna, of what people can go to follow you, your work, if you want to get out, you know, Facebook uh, channels or YouTube channels, whatever you have to people uh, can connect with you, Susanna. My website is occupycorporatism.com. On the website, you can sign up uh, for our newsletter. We have an RSS feed. Also, Facebook and Twitter, you can you can uh, sign up there. I also have a radio show that airs on Thursdays from 1 to 3 Pacific Time or 3 to 5 Central Time. The Region 10 Report on American Freedom Radio, which is broadcast terrestrial markets. Uh, there's about 20 in the United States. And you can also uh, listen online or download the app to your smartphone. Um, your personal government tracking device <laughs> and listen to my show. <laughs> well, why not? Huh? Maybe they'll listen in and can learn something. That's what I always say. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Very good. Occupycorporatism.com. We'll have the link and uh, all the other uh, links related to, of course, uh, this that we've been talking about up on redeyescreations.com. Thanks, Susan. Stay with us. Uh, we'll be right back after a short break. In the second hour coming up, we speak about MIT and the neuroscientists who are there working hard to be able to implant fake memories into your brain or to remove them entirely. The excuse in this case is to cure things like post-traumatic stress and simply erase memories that are considered to be too painful. We discuss the psychological disconnection that people have to their own emotions and memories and how this has developed into a disease of the mind. Constantly we are confronted with the realization that many people do not want to deal with the consequences of their own life and build on the experience that they have and make of them what you can. We discuss the deeper issues that is behind character development and that so-called negative experiences makes you who you are and that those can be tremendously important to build self-esteem and give you a sense of achievement when you overcome these and despite setbacks and challenges manage to overcome them. What the psychiatry-driven pharmacological tyranny is doing, however, is to plan to remove these experiences to keep you in a perpetual state of dependency and like a grown-up kid, never having the experience of overcoming obstacles and manage to rise above it on your own. Don't miss this excellent second hour with Suzanne Posel as we continue for all you members at RedIceMembers.com. You can acquire a subscription there. We have three months up to two years subscription available. For only about the price of two cups of coffee per month, you get access to our archives filled with amazing programs on all kinds of topics. Films, videos, music, commentaries, plus all the new content and the 10 to 12 or so new radio programs that we do each month. Some of our guests scheduled to come on next on Red Ice Radio includes Sonia Barrett and Sherry Edwards, David Icke, Charles Eisenstein, Frotter X and Warren McLaughlin. All right, dear ladies and gentlemen, be well and stay safe. I hope you tune in for the second hour. Thank you so much for listening.